increased cardiac issues with increased seed oil intake was again shown to be harmful by the Women's Health Initiative study. Published first in 2006 on over 48,000 females, this modern-day randomised controlled trial found that reducing saturated fat intake increased cardiac events by 26%. Not just associated with, but caused. And that's the whole point of these randomised controlled trials. They actually are able to demonstrate causality. You may be aware that the lipid heart hypothesis was born out of an experiment in which rabbits were fed cholesterol-enriched seed oil. And so if a rabbit study is good enough to birth the lipid heart hypothesis, it should be good enough to put it to bed too. So this rabbit study, over a five-week period, were fed a high cholesterol diet, except this time without the seed oil. But then some of the rabbits also had LDL injected directly into their veins. And so after five weeks, the rabbits were euthanized and their aortas were examined for atherosclerosis. And guess what? The group injected with the LDL, well, they had less fatty deposits. So much so that the authors of the study stated that LDL was, and I quote, an anti-atherogenic particle. In other words, it seemed to prevent atherosclerosis. What this really says is that the findings of atherosclerosis in the original studies by Nikolai Anikov were in fact likely to have been caused by the seed oil, not the cholesterol. So then if saturated fat and LDL don't cause atherosclerosis, what does? To begin to answer that, we need to consider the various stages in the progression of a typical atherosclerotic plaque. To begin with, I need to make a key point. There actually is a significant amount of LDL in atherosclerotic plaques, or at least the constituents of LDL after it's been broken down. And this is incredibly important to understand because it explains the obsession of mainstream authorities with LDL. Sure, they may be mistaking correlation for causation, as in, no, this cat did not crush the roof. But at least we can understand how they may have got the idea. Let's begin by looking at the role of infection in atherosclerosis. Now, the potential for infections to cause heart disease has been understood for a long time. In fact, patients admitted to hospital with bacteria in their blood are 18 times more likely to have a heart attack or stroke within the next 30 days. That's an 1,800% increase. And for reference, current smokers have an increased risk of heart attack of about two and a half times compared to non-smokers. This 2011 study examined 42 surgically removed atherosclerotic plaques and found DNA evidence of bacteria in all of them. While another 2014 study found that 95% of arterial biopsies from patients with gum disease also had detectable bacterial DNA. But why the focus on gum disease? First of all, epidemiological research finds that people with gum disease have an increased risk of coronary heart disease, about four and a half times greater. Also, the bacteria that commonly cause gum disease, like Porphyromonas gingivalis, are very common. Some studies suggest it's found in the mouths of more than 50% of the population. Furthermore, these and other pathogens frequently enter your bloodstream with teeth brushing or even eating. This study finding bacteria in the blood of 38.5% of children following tooth brushing now that doesn't mean that the only source of infection is from the mouth. Numerous infections can result in bacteria entering the blood. This study of more than 6,000 cases of bacterial blood infection reported numerous causes from bladder, kidney and gallbladder infections to infections of the liver, lungs, gut, soft tissues, even our joints. The fact is basically any infection most anywhere in the body has the capacity to enter your circulation. 
It just so happens, however, that the oral pathogen Porphyromonas gingivalis is one that is the most strongly associated with heart disease. So pigs were injected with this bacteria, Porphyromonas gingivalis, three times a week for five months. Two weeks after the last injection, they were euthanized and their heart arteries and aortas were examined. And pigs who were injected with the bacteria developed significantly more atherosclerosis compared to control pigs, as you can see on the screen. Another key point which I need to make is that other types of infection, including viruses and fungi, have also been strongly associated with heart disease. For example, the UK-based Biobank study found that the risk of developing heart disease within five years after being hospitalised with chronic viral infection was 57% greater. Fungal infections too are quite common inside atherosclerotic plaques. One study evaluated 41 diseased arteries that were removed during bypass graft surgery and found evidence of fungal infection in 11 or 27% of them. And this study raises another significant point, the difficulty of diagnosis of these infections. You see, even when they had the infected artery physically in front of them, standard culture testing was only positive in one out of these cases. And direct microscopic examination didn't detect anything at all. The point is fungal infections are difficult to diagnose. And as a result, I suspect they're heavily underdiagnosed. Dr. Jens Ponikow, an ENT surgeon, used novel methods to test for fungus in 210 consecutive patients with chronic rhinosinusitis, techniques that aren't readily available to us in clinical practice. And 202, or 96%, of them were proven to have fungal involvement. The fact is, we don't have access to this type of testing in clinical practice, and as a result, most cases of fungal infection remain undiagnosed. 